Uh, David and Emily, uh, thank you very much indeed for your very generous uh, introductions. It's a real privilege to be on the line with all of you uh, who um, spend your days uh, uh, caring for patients with TB and providing top service. And I know I'll learn a lot from uh, our interactions today. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, what I'd like to do uh, uh, with our time is, um, is tackle the question of where we are with fluoroquinolones, uh, coming on the heels of uh, some phase three studies that got published last year. And I think you'll uh, agree with me in slide two that um, we, we're not there yet. It still takes six months to treat TB, even in the simple cases of drug susceptible infection. And we need shorter treatment regimens. We'd like to increase the intermittency, that is um, to reduce the visit uh, uh, burden for directly observed therapy. And uh, we'd like to stop relying as much on older drugs. And I think you're uh, all familiar with the fact that we're losing the use of INH, uh, even here in the United States, where the case rate is relatively low. Uh, about 10% of infections last year were INH resistant. So uh, that's the overarching goal, and um, quinolones um, may, may uh, help us in this regard. And I'll come back to this uh, uh, assessment at the very end of the talk to see how we're doing on trying to achieve these three goals. So um, I've broken my um, comments down into four categories, as you see in the slide. And I'd like to spend uh, a bit of time at the beginning talking about the run-up to these, um, these uh, phase three studies, and then bring you up to speed on the phase three studies in part two, uh, talk a little bit about new uh, quinolone-containing experimental regimens, and then raise some issues about special situations where quinolones may or may not be helpful. So uh, getting to the, the run-up to these phase three studies. Uh, quinolones, um, as David said, um, have really come uh, into their own. They're widely used in many aspects of infectious diseases. Uh, in the um, um, marketplace, there are first, second, third, and fourth generation uh, quinolones. And I'll call your attention to the fact that gadifloxacin and amoxifloxacin are in the fourth generation classes. Both of those were introduced into the market in 1999 and, and 2000. So they've been with us for a while. And this next slide shows that there have been a few casualties along the way. Uh, Sparfloxacin uh, was on the market for four years, uh, but was discontinued due to QT prolongation and phototoxicity. And gadifloxacin was on the market for seven years, but was withdrawn from North America due to concerns of dysglycemia, that is, both high and low blood sugars in individuals receiving gadifloxacin. Quinolones uh, work by uh, inhibiting the ability of the organism to replicate its DNA. Uh, and I won't uh, belabor the, the, the mechanisms other than to say they kill from within unlike uh, drugs like isoniazide, which um, damage the cell wall and lead bacteria to burst and release their inflammatory contents, quinolones uh, shut down the ability of the organism to replicate and then make it a sitting duck for the immune system. Um, the enzymes that are inhibited are DNA gyrase and topoisomerase, and uh, M. tuberculosis has two genes, uh, gyre A and gyre B, that encode its DNA gyrase. And uh, uh, that is a major mechanism of quinolone-resistant TB, uh, uh, mutations altering the sequence of uh, those enzymes can uh, allow the enzymes to work but not be inhibited by fluoroquinolones. And then a minor drug resistance mechanism is efflux pumps, and uh, both have been identified in M. tuberculosis quinolone-resistant strains. Uh, importantly, for the purposes of diagnostics, uh, quinolone resistance is a little bit like rifampin resistance. All of the action is in a very small uh, uh, pair of sequences of DNA, the quinolone resistance determining region. Uh, QD, QRDRA is only 30 uh, amino acids, about 100 base pairs, easily amplified uh, by PCR. And the same is true for QRDRB. So uh, we can look forward to, um, uh, to uh, 
good diagnostic uh, accuracy using uh, the wonders of PCR. And uh, as some of you may know, uh, the Hain test, which is um, uh, a, a PCR-based test that can be done directly on sputum, uh, is widely used overseas, can indeed detect the majority of quinolone-resistant TB by amplifying those QRDR regions that I just mentioned and then using um, uh, DNA hybridization uh, slot blot technology to identify whether a strain is resistant or susceptible. So um, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss a case before I go on any further to discuss the quinolones uh, and their, their role in, uh, in TB and how we got up to, uh, to 2014. So here's a 62-year-old man with dyspnea, weight loss, and fever. He's had it for two months. Uh, and uh, that's the, uh, the actual gentleman there sitting next to me. Uh, he had lost uh, 60 pounds, uh, was unable to complete sentences. He was so dyspneic, couldn't climb a flight of stairs, was not uh, the kind of guy who went to doctors, and had smoked a lot of cigarettes, 60 pack years. Uh, when he came to, uh, to the hospital, he had a temperature of 101, 100.1, uh, respiratory rate of 28. He weighed 113 pounds, and his SAT was 91%. His white count was 4,400. And uh, here is his uh, chest CT. And as you can see, there are bilateral pneumonias, and there's a cavity uh, in the right upper lobe. Sputum showed uh, uh, moderate polys and light respiratory flora, and uh, we admitted him to an isolation room. So the question I'd like to pose for you uh, is, what do you do next? What would you do next? Um, and um, um, uh, I'll say that um, there's no one right answer uh, among these choices, uh, uh, but there are um, uh, some uh, wrong answers. So uh, I won't um, necessarily uh, read them out uh, to you, um, but I'd love to see uh, how the polling goes, and then uh, I'll give you my comments on um, on on what may be appropriate therapy. Well, it looks like a lot of you uh, think this fellow has TB and would like to start four drug therapy. I see 75% uh, of you uh, uh, think that that's a, an excellent answer. And, um, and some of you think this could be um, uh, uh, a, um, a different respiratory tract infection. I see about 7% of the votes for uh, giving him broad-spectrum therapy with uh, community-acquired pneumonia therapy, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin plus vancomycin to treat for the possibility of MRSA. And um, so I'll go on and say uh, I think that um, uh, pretty much uh, uh, all of these uh, would be reasonable things to do on admission pending further evaluation of his sputum, except for answer D. Uh, I think we've learned over the last uh, 20 years that fluoroquinolone monotherapy uh, should be used uh, very cautiously when tuberculosis is on the differential diagnosis. A, a fellow, uh, ID fellow of ours, Amy Ginsberg, uh, back a few years ago, looked at uh, 55 patients who uh, were uh, admitted to Johns Hopkins Hospital over a four-year period who were diagnosed with TB. And among the 35% of them who had been treated with a quinolone prior to their TB diagnosis, 11% of them had uh, resulted in uh, quinolone-resistant TB. And that did not happen in the other 65% of patients who had not been exposed to a quinolone. So uh, uh, in, in uh, general infectious diseases, we need to continue to uh, educate uh, our, our practitioners whenever there's a question of TB on the differential avoid fluoroquinolone monotherapy. And we'll come back and talk about this a little bit later in my presentation. Well, back to quinolones for TB. Um, as the quinolones were being developed in the 1990s, it became clear that they all had activity, uh, but that the third and fourth generation agents like sparfloxacin and moxifloxacin had the lowest MICs, that is the highest activity against M. tuberculosis. And those later generation fluoroquinolones, uh, as the color scheme shows in the PKPD slide, were also the best uh, uh, PK, they had the best uh, pharmacologic parameters with high C maxes, three to four micrograms per ml, and high AUCs. 
So it became clear that uh, the leading uh, agents for TB, Moxie and GADI, had both low MICs and good pharmacologic parameters. So um, back in 99, um, uh, uh, some of my students and Dick Chase on and I were um, uh, privileged to get a grant to try this out in mice. And um, moxifloxacin alone, as well as moxie plus INH, um, prevented mice from dying of TB. Uh, the reviews came back with uh, uh, English that sounded like a French guy had written it, and indeed it turned out to be Jacques Rosset who reviewed this paper. And Jacques, of course, had done uh, much of the seminal work already on quinolones uh, for TB. Uh, I'll show you just some of it in this next slide. Uh, looking across uh, the board at, uh, at different uh, regimens, uh, the yellow uh, curve is uh, killing uh, of uh, MTB in mice over four weeks, and you can see that uh, INH does indeed kill very well uh, with about two logs of killing. Uh, that is a hundredfold killing, and so does moxifloxacin at a relatively low uh, dose, 100 milligrams per kilogram. Moxie has fine uh, killing potential, superior to that of sparfloxacin. So uh, this got us all pretty excited about trying to put the quinolones to work uh, in, in TB, and we began to contemplate uh, studying quinolones uh, in combinations in mice uh, to see how they might fit in with multidrug therapy. And just to remind you, uh, the killing of MTB in a mouse is uh, in two phases. There's a quick kill, and uh, then there's a slow sterilization. And the different antibiotics have, uh, have differential abilities in these two phases. Uh, streptomycin and INH are the most famous killers, bactericidal agents, whereas pyrazinamide and rifampin seem to do the job with sterilization. And we'll come back to this uh, paradigm later on. It's also possible with mice to treat them and then stop treatment and then wait about three months and see if any of the mice relapse. So in mice, you can uh, do essentially a phase three study of treatment regimens. And beyond that, what you can't do in humans, but you can do in mice, is to sacrifice them along the way, take out their lungs, and count bacteria to see how the antibiotic regimens are doing. So um, with that in mind, uh, we set out with the assistance of a then uh, very uh, uh, gifted infectious disease fellow, Eric Nuremberger, to try quinolones out uh, in the TB mouse model. And I think you all uh, are aware of the abbreviation system. Isoniazide is H, rifampin is R, pyrazinamide is Z. And this, of course, is standard therapy shown in the purple curve. And you see that biphasic kill uh, with a plateauing out in late phase, essentially the continuation phase. And you see that untreated mice uh, continue to have a high burden tuberculosis. So the first thing uh, that uh, uh, Eric and Jacques uh, and I tried was the, the knee-jerk uh, uh, thought. Let's add moxifloxacin to standard therapy. Now, you notice that ethambutol is missing, and that's because ethambutol is unnecessary when we treat drug-susceptible TB. It's a safety drug in case patients turn out to have MDR or XDR. So we left out the ethambutol in this experiment, but, but I'm quite confident that it wouldn't have made much of a difference. So you see that when we added Moxie, it was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, we got a, a slightly better killing in this red curve, but not by a lot. And uh, that was a sort of a, 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 a disappointment. But then a surprise came. When we took away the isoniazide and put Moxifloxacin in its place, 2MRZ, 4MR, we got this blue curve where a massive amount of killing occurred in the first two months. There, were only, there was only one log uh, of, of bacteria in the lungs. Uh, one log is 10 bacteria uh, on average. And uh, by three months, there were zero CFU counts. So taking away the isoniazide and putting moxie in place seemed to have uh, exciting potential in the mouse model. This was in 2004. And uh, when the clinical trial population saw this, they got excited. And they said, let's, let's test some of these regimens in humans. 
Before I get to the clinical experience, I just want to say a word about why substituting might have been uh, so good rather than adding moxifloxacin. And here was a wonderful experiment done by Jacques Rosset and Deepak Almeida, where they did a, just a very simple thing. First, they treated mice with isoniazide alone at different concentrations over eight weeks. And you see that the lung counts of bacteria um, even with a very low dose of isoniazide, go down just a little bit, one milligram per kilogram. When they gave three milligrams per kilogram, they got better killing, higher doses, better killing, still higher doses, even better killing, 25 milligrams per kilogram, even better killing, and all the way up to 50 um, milligrams per kilogram, very good killing. So isoniazide gave a nice dose-dependent response um, in killing. Uh, then they took a different base regimen, rifampin pyrazinamide, which also gives very good killing over eight weeks, and they added back those very same amounts of isoniazide. So here you see what happens with the base of rifampin pyrazinamide, where we've added uh, uh, isoniazide at 1.56 milligrams per kilogram. Surprisingly, adding isoniazide made the outcome worse. Following the pattern of the last experiment, when they added a uh, higher dose, 3.13, killing was yet worse. When they added more, killing got worse. All the way up, as you can see in this progression, the more isoniazide, uh, the uh, worse the killing. So in contrast to so many things in life, when uh, mice are receiving um, uh, rifampin pyrazinamide, adding more isoniazide is paradoxically not better. More is not better. And this underscores uh, uh, the fact that um, uh, there is a, an antagonism between isoniazide and the combination of rifampin pyrazinamide. Indeed, it's been said many times that perhaps we've been shooting ourselves in the foot with standard therapy, making it less efficient by combining isoniazide with the antagonistic uh, combination of rifampin pyrazinamide. This begins to explain the uh, mouse study that I talked about earlier where uh, substituting out INH and replacing it with another cidal drug like moxifloxacin could do so well. First of all, it relieved the antagonism of H and RZ, and then second of all, we are adding a very good killing drug, moxifloxacin. So, uh, this was the basis for beginning to contemplate these um, mouse-derived uh, combinations in humans. Uh, there were a total of four phase two serial sputum uh, culture conversion studies where patients are followed on treatment for eight weeks and uh, their, cult their sputum is taken and uh, the endpoint is a culture conversion from a culture positive to culture negative. And I won't go through all of them, uh, but I'll take you through uh, the Berman Chason study where moxifloxacin was added to standard therapy, or stated another way, it was used to replace a thambutol so that uh, HRZ was still there, uh, as well as HR. Uh, and then later, where the substitution that I spoke so much about was tested by Dorman et al. And let's see if the mouse uh, regimen predicted what would happen in humans. Can we trust our mouse models? Uh, here is the hound dog leading the hunters, and the hound is saying to himself, I can't smell a damn thing. Well, let's see if our animal models uh, were doing uh, us justice. So uh, to remind you, when we simply added moxie to standard therapy, or, or stated another way, when we uh, put moxie in a place where a thambutol would normally be, we got a small effect. So we would predict that doing that in humans would give a small uh, incremental effect. And that was, in fact, what was done in study 27. And uh, as you can see, it involved about um, 240 patients uh, with a daily uh, uh, regimen and also a thrice weekly regimen. Um, and these patients were monitored for eight weeks, and the outcome was uh, sputum culture conversion. Of course, that's different from cure. Uh, cure is a phase three study, and we'll come to that shortly. But these are uh, surrogate endpoints looking at only eight weeks. So here you see the results of study 27. Uh, between zero, with two weeks and eight weeks, 
the moxifloxacin regimen uh, where moxy was added in place of ethanotol and just a standard therapy regimen uh, really were no different. But there was an effect during the eight weeks where moxifloxacin led to higher rates of culture conversion at four weeks and then at six weeks, and that that was statistically uh, significant. So this uh, essentially uh, exonerated the mice. This is pretty much what the mouse model showed. Um, no big uh, excitement by putting moxifloxacin in place of ethambutol. Um, let's see about the other uh, uh, sample regimen where we replace isoniazide with moxifloxacin. This is what the mouse model would predict to be highly beneficial. What happens when we test humans between zero and two months in a uh, phase two serial uh, sputum culture conversion uh, study, and that was done in study 28. Um, here you see it was the same design. Patients randomized for eight weeks to receive uh, either uh, standard therapy or uh, moxifloxacin in place of isoniazide. Well, uh, this study was done in 344 patients at 26 sites. Um, Many of the patients actually came from North America and others uh, from Uganda, and the patients were well matched. And uh, here you see the results. Um, uh, whether it was in solid media or liquid media, and I'll call your attention to the, uh, the solid media results, the black dots being standard therapy shown here, and the gray dots being moxifloxacin, there was really no difference in uh, the rate of culture conversion between the two regimens. That was also true whether one looked in liquid media. No difference between standard therapy and swapping out isoniazide and putting moxifloxacin in place. So uh, uh, here, um, uh, in, in contrast to the excitement in mice, uh, um, moxifloxacin in place of isoniazide was pretty much the same as standard therapy, and this was published in 2009. So um, the phase two studies um, uh, paved the way for confidence that at least moxifloxacin-containing regimens were not hurting patients, and they seem to be equivalent at least at the two-month mark. And this um, uh, uh, stimulated enthusiasm for ponying up uh, considerable amounts of money to do a phase three study where test regimens would be used for the full six months or four months, um, and uh, then patients would be monitored for at least 12, sometimes 24 months, to see how many of them relapsed. And the endpoints, of course, in these uh, studies were uh, treatment failure at the end of uh, treatment for six months, and then relapse at the end of the follow-up period. And as I mentioned, these are, of course, much more expensive than the phase two studies. Uh, so uh, late 2014, uh, three of these were co-published in the same uh, issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the first one was the Ofelitub study, where, uh, as you can see, uh, a fluoroquinolone, namely gadifloxacin, was used in place of ethambutol, a very simple design, and treatment was shortened from six months down to four months. The second study was the REMOX study, which had three arms, standard therapy, and uh, a quinolone was uh, used in place of ethambutol, just like uh, the previous study, and treatment was stopped at four months, and the patients were followed. This study also did the substitution analysis, where a quinolone, namely MOXI, was used in place of isoniazide, and that was the third arm. And then the last of the three studies was the Rifiquin study, uh, which, um, uh, as you can see, had a single four-month study uh, where um, moxifloxacin was used in place of isoniazide, and then in the continuation phase, moxifloxacin continued to replace isoniazide, but the rifamycin was changed from rifampin R to rifapentine P. Uh, and then another regimen, a third regimen, was tested in which um, uh, uh, the continuation phase was a standard four months, but it was a highly intermittent uh, four-month regimen with treatment given only one day a week uh, with moxifloxacin and a high dose of rifapentine, 1,200 milligrams. 
So let's start at the first one, the Oflatub study, the first of three, and I'll take you through uh, the results that were uh, published in the New England Journal. Uh, these, um, uh, this study involved 1,800 plus patients, uh, 1,200 completed the study in a per protocol analysis. Uh, the patients were followed for a full 24 months and it was done in five sub-Saharan countries with about an 18% rate of HIV co-infection. And some of the patients were started on ART during, uh, 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 were allowed to be started on ART um, uh, during the treatment phase, uh, but this was uh, uh, relatively rare in this large study. So here are the results. Um, an unfavorable response was either treatment failure or relapse. And as you can see, with standard therapy, uh, an unfavorable response occurred 11% of the time in the per-protocol analysis. Um, and with the four-month regimen with gadifloxacin in place of ethambutol and then continuing gadifloxacin into the continuation phase, the unfavorable response rate was almost 18%. And this was worse than standard therapy in a statistically significant way. Uh, or stated uh, 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 statistically correctly, this experimental regimen failed to show uh, non-inferiority. The goal was to show both regimens were the same, that is, the, the new regimen was non-inferior to standard therapy, but in, uh, the statistics showed that, yes, this new regimen was inferior, uh, non-inferiority was not demonstrated. Uh, so why did this happen? Well, uh, the issue was relapse. Uh, that was the major reason uh, for uh, unfavorable outcomes. There were relatively rare treatment failures at the end of either four or six months. Uh, one important thing that was observed was no adverse effects of the fluoroquinolones, and particularly with gadifloxacin, there was some concern that there would be dysglycemia, but that was not seen. And also, uh, there was quite a bit of variability between sites. Um, the unfavorable outcome rate in South Africa was almost 26%, whereas in Guinea, it was only 13%. There was a much, uh, there was a skew in HIV positivity. Almost half the South African patients were HIV positive, only 1% of the Senegalese patients. And there was also a skew with respect to cavitary TB, uh, in two of the countries, South Africa and Senegal, 90% of the patients had a cavity, whereas in uh, three of the other countries, only 20% had a cavity. Here you see that when the subgroups um, were evaluated, there were some um, uh, interesting uh, subgroup analyses uh, uh, pearls. Looking geographically, um, with this dotted line uh, uh, differentiating whether uh, the gadifloxacin-containing regimen was better versus control being better, you can see that in Senegal and in South Africa, the uh, gadifloxacin four-month regimen was significantly worse than standard therapy with these error bars not even crossing the zero line. And similarly, with respect to patient risk factors, there were some other interesting observations. Um, uh, in individuals who had a low body weight, a BMI of 16 or less, the gadifloxacin-containing regimen was as good as standard therapy. And in patients who lacked cavitary disease, the gadifloxacin regimen was as good as standard therapy. Of course, these subgroups didn't have enough power to make uh, statistically significant statements, but they were interesting food for thought that perhaps in underweight individuals, the regimen could be uh, of some interest, and when there was non-cavitary disease, the gadifloxacin regimen could be of some interest. The, just taken from the author's comments, uh, why did the study fail to show uh, um, uh, lack of non-inferiority? Well, they said the patient population was highly varied, and they also pointed out that um, uh, instead of the old-fashioned um, uh, 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 emphasis on uh, treatment failure, uh, or that is, I uh, should have said relapse alone, this was a composite uh, endpoint, and they did that because that's what the regulators wanted. So in addition to uh, relapse or treatment failure, the, uh, the outcome was also dependent on death and dropout. 
uh, the, the authors dismissed uh, medication variability, lab variability, or the open uh, label design, and I agree with them that those are unlikely to explain uh, the failure. Let's go to the second of the three uh, uh, studies, namely the REMOX study, which, uh, as I mentioned, looked at substituting a quinolone for a thambutol and then running it out for the full continuation phase, uh, uh, as shown in the middle bar, or actually substituting a quinolone in place of isoniazide, uh, MRZE for two months and then MR uh, for two months. Well, uh, this study was similarly large, 1,900 plus patients, uh, uh, 1,548 completed the uh, study. There was a shorter follow-up, namely 12 months. It was done in um, a, a larger catchment area, nine countries from three continents, uh, South Africa contributing the largest number of patients at 47, and there was a 7% rate of HIV uh, uh, co-infection in the TB population. And here were the results for the REMOX study. Standard therapy um, had an unfavorable response, that is uh, a relapse uh, or treatment failure of 8%. The moxifloxacin in place of the thambutol had a 15% unfavorable response, which was statistically worse than control. And substituting moxy for isoniazide uh, had a 20% unfavorable response against uh, statistically demonstrating lack of non-inferiority. Um, what were some of the observations uh, from this study? Again, uh, relapse was the, the, the culprit. Treatment failure was not an issue at the end of four or six months. Uh, importantly, there were no significant fluoroquinolone adverse events. With moxifloxacin, uh, we have concerns about uh, uh, joint uh, uh, and Achilles tendonitis uh, joint arthropathies and Achilles tendonitis and QT uh, prolongation, and neither, neither of those were detected. The study was heavily influenced by the South African arm. Uh, one very interesting assessment uh, by these authors uh, was a nice discussion that um, to put an old issue to rest, when they carefully looked at the patients from Asia, which were mostly Indian patients, and those from Africa, there was no difference at all in uh, the, uh, the outcomes between these two regions. It had long been said that uh, uh, TB in India was more indolent uh, and TB in Africa was more aggressive. Uh, that did not uh, prove true in this uh, multinational study. Um, and interestingly, using quinolone in place of ethambutol seemed slightly better with a failure rate of 15% versus putting quinolone in place of INH. Um, uh, which had a 20% failure rate, and the author said, well, um, the obvious reason is we were using three drugs in, uh, in the uh, quinolone for ethambutol regimen, whereas uh, the substitution for isoniazide, only two drugs were being used in the continuation phase. Um, here you see that uh, the study was dominated uh, by South African subjects, 47% out of the 1,931, and um, you can also see that uh, this, the, um, the regimens perform very well during uh, the treatment time. So here is 26 weeks, the six-month mark. There were really no differences in, uh, in, in treatment failures, but the problem came out uh, towards the end of the study, uh, a year after treatment completion, uh, where the two test regimens in red dots and uh, uh, red dashes and green dots showed statistically worse uh, uh, relapse rates. Uh, one interesting note uh, that the uh, authors also pointed out was that um, with the, um, uh, uh, the, the new experimental regimens that contain moxifloxacin, there was a slight advantage in culture conversion. In fact, they essentially exonerated uh, the phase two studies. Uh, and here you can see at eight weeks, uh, the transition from uh, uh, intensive phase to continuation phase, there was an advantage in the moxifloxacin groups as opposed to standard therapy in blue. And that was true whether it was solid media or liquid media. So uh, just to paraphrase what the authors said, the reasons for failure were they, they did a little mouse bashing. Um, the mouse, they questioned the reliability of the mouse model. 
They questioned the predictive reliability of the phase two studies. Uh, they were called into question, and they pointed out that we certainly need improved biomarkers. And uh, going forward, we need a way to uh, do faster and cheaper phase three studies. Uh, it's generally believed that these phase three studies uh, cost in the neighborhood of $20 million. So the last study, uh, the Rifiquin study, uh, number three of three, uh, had a very interesting design. Um, it, um, it replaced INH in both of the test arms. And uh, in the second test arm, it uh, used rifamycin in place of rifampin at uh, 900 milligrams or 15 milligrams per kilogram with a twice weekly design. Uh, so in, essentially, they were trying to do away with isoniazide and shorten treatment and increase the intermittency. And then the third regimen uh, was a highly intermittent continuation phase with uh, moxie and rifapentine at, at very high dose, 20 milligrams per kilogram, given once weekly. Um, and of course, uh, as I, I think you, you know, rifapentine has a much longer half-life than rifampin, 10 to 15 hours as opposed to two to three hours. It has a, a much high, it gives a much higher AUC, more exposure to the rifamycin with rifapentine. So in the Rifiquin study, uh, a smaller number of patients this time, uh, 827, 514 completed therapy. These were spread across three arms. There was 18 months of follow-up time, and this was done in four sub-Saharan countries and had a 28% uh, incidence of T, uh, HIV co-infection. And uh, here you see uh, the results for the Rifiquin study. Uh, standard therapy uh, gave an unfavorable response of 4.9%. The four-month regimen replacing isoniazide with, uh, with moxifloxacin uh, gave an 18% unfavorable response. This was highly statistically significant in showing lack of non-inferiority. But uh, interestingly, um, uh, the, the highly intermittent regimen, regimen 3, gave an unfavorable response rate of 3.2% and was therefore as effective as standard therapy. Um, observations from this study uh, were that, um, again, relapse, not treatment failure, was the major reason for an unfavorable outcome. No quinolone adverse events uh, of significance were noticed. Uh, the authors pointed out that with adherence in the weekly and biweekly continuation phase regimens was higher than with standard therapy, um, and uh, uh, that they uh, pointed out that um, uh, the um, uh, biweekly uh, rifapentine at a lower dose gives a higher weekly AUC than the high dose, and uh, therefore. Uh, since the once weekly lower uh, AUC regimen did so well, maybe AUC is uh, a little too much, too heavily emphasized, and CMAX may be an important parameter uh, with the rifamycins. But here is a very interesting observation, uh, specifically adherence. Uh, the adherence was about the same, 100% in blue, 95% uh, in red, etc., about the same in the first two months of the intensive phase. But the um, the, the twice weekly four month regimen had uh, very high rates of 100% compliance, and the once weekly six month regimen similarly had very high rates of adherence. So, um, uh, this was um, uh, a, a, a very valuable observation, and I'll point out that while all patients received 56 doses in the intensive phase, in that uh, six month regimen, the one that was uh, as good as standard therapy, those individuals only had to take 18 doses after they finished uh, their first two months of treatment. So it's a highly intermittent uh, regimen, which would uh, obviously reduce directly observed therapy costs if, if used more widely. Uh, here you see, again, the, the reason was, uh, was relapse. Um, at, at six months or four months, the numbers of treatment failures were about the same, but the problem was relapse of the four-month regimen out at the, uh, uh, the one-year uh, follow-up, or 18 months after treatment enrollment. So uh, uh, what did the authors have to say about their study? Um, they uh, bragged about the fact that it had a higher rate of adherence, um, which, uh, as they well should have, uh, with the, uh, the once-weekly continuation phase. 
They pointed out that it doesn't require isoniazide. That third regimen, uh, six months with one weekly continuation phase, uh, is an INH-free regimen. Good if directly observed therapy is mandatory, would clearly decrease the cost of supervision. One issue, though, is that rifapentine needs to be given with food. And in this study, every uh, rifapentine dose was given um, with uh, 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 two boiled eggs and bread uh, for every subject. And then, um, of course, uh, another issue is cost with moxifloxacin and rifapentine uh, being relatively expensive. I'd uh, like to just very briefly touch on um, uh, a, a fourth study, uh, one done in Chennai and published in 2013, um, where uh, they uh, added uh, gadifloxacin or moxifloxacin in place of ethambutol, so uh, similar to the Oflotub study. Um, and this also used some intermittency. Uh, the two test regimens with GADI in place of ethambutol and then continued, or MOXI in place of ethambutol and then continued, were both thrice weekly studies. Uh, this uh, study um, was uh, stopped by the DSMB prematurely uh, after only partial enrollment um, because of uh, uh, non, uh, because of inferiority of the test regimens. Um, and uh, too many failures at the end of treatment. But uh, one interesting note was that the moxifloxacin regimen, while uh, much worse um, uh, at uh, two months of enrollment, began to be comparable to control treatment way out at two years after enrollment. Um, this uh, failed to show statistical significance. The, uh, the uh, rate of recurrence was 6% in standard therapy and 10% in the moxi arm. It was fully 16% in the GADI arm. But this, uh, again, pointed out that perhaps uh, there's something to uh, moxifloxacin, and maybe uh, there is uh, further work that could be done uh, with using intermittent moxi-containing regimens, uh, as such as uh, we, we observed in the Rifaquin study. So to uh, take a breath and summarize uh, the outcomes of these three uh, phase three studies, all three were set up as non-inferiority trials versus standard therapy. Uh, in, in each, there was a four-month quinolone-containing regimen, and in each, that four-month regimen was not non-inferior to standard therapy. That is, standard therapy was better each time. But Rifiquin uh, showed that a six-month regimen was as effective, and that's uh, a, a cause for some notice. Um, the unfavorable outcomes were always due to a relapse, not treatment failure. And very importantly, there were no significant adverse effects of quinolones uh, in long-term use. So um, why did this happen? Why, why did we spend uh, so much money to get three negative results with four-month studies? Well, I think uh, that it comes back to uh, the difference between uh, uh, sterilization and bactericidal activity. Uh, culture conversion at eight weeks is a measure of how well the regimen kills, and uh, relapse uh, after completing therapy and waiting a year or more is a measure of how sterilizing the regimen is. And uh, just to remind you of what I was saying earlier, um, uh, culture conversion is a measure of bactericidal activity that we can observe in the mouse model. Um, uh, sterilizing activity is harder to measure in humans. You have to finish the trial and then monitor them for relapse. Well, what do we know from the mouse model about these uh, the parameters for quinolones? I showed you this slide before. Moxi has excellent killing activity, perhaps even better than isoniazide. So Moxi is a very good bactericidal drug, and that was borne out in the phase two uh, sputum culture conversion studies. But where MOXI falls short, and this is probably true of all of the quinolones, is in its inability to sterilize. And here was a very interesting study by uh, Dr. Grosset, um, who gave my standard therapy for eight weeks, and then gave them only isoniazide in purple, and only moxifloxacin in red. And as you can see, um, and then uh, standard therapy would be in green. Um, with standard therapy, good killing and out to sterilization. But with MOXI alone, the sterilizing activity was inferior to that of isoniazide. So uh, uh, quinolones uh, are not um, as powerful as sterilizing drugs as even drugs like INH, which are, are, are considered poor 
sterilizing drugs. So um, uh, the sterilization issue is the, is the problem. Moxie, uh, when given alone, is not a good sterilizing agent. Um, uh, but for bactericidal activity, Moxie does well. And perhaps that um, uh, explains these phase three studies and perhaps the answer was staring us in the face in the mouse models before we invested so heavily in the phase three studies. So um, uh, uh, I want to um, uh, pause and do another case before uh, going on to the final uh, two uh, smaller portions of the talk. Um, uh, here is a, a woman, uh, 80 years old, who was from suburban Maryland, who was referred to me by a rheumatologist. She had developed uh, progressive left hand stiffness, then bilateral shoulder and knee pain. Uh, she went on non-steroidals as well as pulse dose steroids, but they were ineffective. And the uh, infectious disease consult was to ask the question, is it safe to use an anti-TNF agent? Well, the story was more complicated. <clears throat> At the age of 21, back in 1955, she had had pulmonary TB. Um, this was early on in the antimicrobial era. She got nine months of rest therapy in a sanatorium and then isoniazide, streptomycin, and PAS. Uh, that was a failure. Uh, she had to go on to a right upper lobectomy, and that uh, did the trick. She improved, uh, went off antibiotics, married, had four children, and was uh, relatively healthy, except for some other medical conditions. No more tuberculosis. Uh, unfortunately, the records uh, were discarded. Um, uh, we had no idea of whether this was uh, a drug-resistant strain that was associated with failure. Her current meds were ibuprofen and Norvasc. Um, she had normal uh, uh, counts and LFTs, and her tuberculin skin test was three millimeters. So the question for you is, we're going ahead with a TNF inhibitor. Um, should this woman receive further TB therapy with the intention of giving her a TNF inhibitor? Choices are yes, uh, give more TB therapy, B, no, and C, maybe. Well, I see some uh, rapid voting accumulating, and it um, uh, uh, looks like uh, about uh, 70 of you have answered, and uh, about 70% say yes, we should give uh, this woman more TB therapy, and about 15% uh, uh, of you say no or maybe. Well, my second question for you is this. Let's say we are going to give her more uh, therapy and we're going to treat her for latent uh, TB, treatment for latent infection. What regimen should we use? And, uh, uh, and I agree that uh, she should get some treatment. Uh, that would be my answer to the previous question. But now the question is what to give her. Should it be INH for nine months, INH for six months, rifampin for four months, or rifampin PZA for two months? Well, it looks like the votes are coming in, uh, and uh, I see that almost 80% of you are voting for regimen C, and I would totally agree with you. Uh, my, uh, uh, I think there's only one wrong answer, and that would be answer D. Uh, Rifampin PZA has been uh, uh, recommended against by CDC because when it was studied uh, a decade and a half ago, it had some unexplained deaths in patients with latent infection. But um, INH for nine months and rifampin for four months are recommended in the guidelines. But uh, the issue here is that um, uh, this woman was already treated with isoniazide back in the 50s, and she may have an isoniazide-resistant strain. So I think for her latent TB infection, if we are going to give her anything, it should be rifampin for four months. So. Um, uh, very briefly, in the remaining uh, 15 minutes or so, I'd like to um, talk about uh, quinolones and experimental regimens, uh, and then talk briefly uh, about some special situations. Um, uh, what about rifamycin quinolone combinations? The success of the rifaquin study got everybody thinking about um, using rifapentine with, with quinolones, and uh, there's some exciting data from the mice that that has promise. And here you can see that rifapentine gives very high uh, AUC levels uh, because of its long half-life, whereas rifampin uh, always drops below the MIC of the organism uh, when used daily. Um, so 
uh, going back to the mouse model, I'm going to show you some data about um, uh, treatment um, uh, uh, bactericidal activity of rifapentine, moxifloxacin, and pyrazinamide, but also show you the sterilizing potential. And here you see that um, with two months of treatment um, with uh, um, uh, uh, rifapentine, 15 mg per kg, moxifloxacin, and pyrazinamide, you kill almost uh, all of the organisms. Um, uh, but that that regimen and, and all of its partners are not sterilizing. All of the mice show relapses. But if we go out to a total of three months, um, rifapentine, moxie, and pyrazinamide not only kill all the bacteria, no uh, bacteria uh, is appreciated uh, in any of the mice at three months, and then we monitor them for relapse, we see that um, uh, uh, in, in this regimen, uh, uh, rifapentine 10 mg per kilogram, moxie, and pyrazinamide five days out of seven, there was not only complete killing, but also lack of relapse. So studies like this um, uh, uh, have prompted a lot of excitement about combinations of uh, rifapentine and moxifloxacin. And here you see that um, uh, with uh, rifapentine 10 mg per kg, moxifloxacin, and pyrazinamide five days out of seven, uh, at, at 10 weeks of therapy, we can uh, prevent relapse and cure all the mice. So uh, mouse studies have showed some promise of uh, combinations of rifapentine, moxifloxacin, and pyrazinamide. Um, uh, this is probably due to the increased rifamycin exposure because of the long half-life of rifapentine. And, um, uh, and, and uh, rifapentine uh, can be used more than just weekly, and that was also shown um, in the uh, Rifaquin study. So um, I think we should uh, stay tuned for more work on uh, more uh, uh, use of rifapentine, uh, and indeed the uh, tuberculosis uh, trials consortium is looking at uh, moxifloxacin, rifapentine, and pyrazinamide combination regimens, looking at uh, two days a week and three days a week increasing the exposure of rifapentine in the setting of moxie and pyrazinamide. Lastly, I'd like to talk about a few special situations. I'll start with a case. Um, this is a two-year-old um, child in Baltimore who has fever, malaise, and is uh, fallen off of uh, his growth curve. He visited his grandparents in India for seven months. Um, and now has a 12 millimeter tuberculin skin test. The chest X-ray shows a bilateral patchy infiltrates at both bases, and uh, another doctor started him on standard therapy, uh, HRZE. Uh, you see him now after being on treatment for eight weeks, and his gastric aspirates times three are no growth so far. Both of his parents have positive IGRAs, but negative chest X-rays. The child is still intermittently febrile, and the chest X-ray is being read as worsening. So the question is, what would you do? And uh, please vote. Would you stay the course with four-drug therapy, uh, narrowing down to a two-drug continuation phase? Would you ask the micro lab to hold the cultures until 12 weeks? Would you request a bronchoscopy in the operating room? Do you think we should expose this child to uh, 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 x-rays with a chest CT? Should we switch to an MDR cocktail that includes a quinolone, or should we uh, switch to an MDR cocktail that, uh, that excludes a fluoroquinolone because of concerns of quinolones in children? And I'll add that there is, a problem, there is in my view, no one right answer uh, uh, for this case. So it looks like a lot of you um, are, are um, saying that we should, uh, about 55% are saying that we could, should do a bronchoscopy, and about 40% of you are saying that we should add an MDR cocktail that includes a fluoroquinolone. Um, I think that's very interesting. Um, I discussed this case with a PEDS ID colleague of mine, and uh, he pointed out uh, one thing, which of course is that uh, uh, bilateral patchy infiltrates in a child are not typical in tuberculosis. In fact, uh, the most important hallmark is um, uh, hyaluradenopathy. And we don't know if this child has hyaluradenopathy. It's often missed on a chest x-ray. 
So I think a chest CT to look for hyalur adenopathy is essential. And uh, I think we're always going to be on uh, unstable ground uh, unless we make a, a, a heroic try to get the organism. So I would uh, both get a chest CT and uh, do a bronchoscopy in the operating room. It's also certainly within uh, the realm of possibility that this is not TB and uh, a bronchoscopy would help. It might reveal uh, a different pathogen uh, and that that might account for this child's uh, treatment failure. So I would not switch him to an MDR cocktail just yet. Uh, I would probably keep him on uh, TB drugs um, and, uh, but try to do a, a more intensive workup with a CT and a bronchoscopy. This um, is also a case that gives me a chance to uh, review the literature of whether quinolones are safe in children. Um, and I'll point out that only Cipro is FDA approved for use in children. The others are theoretically contraindicated. Uh, however, there's growing use of ofloxacin and moxifloxacin in children with MD, MDRTB. And uh, uh, a recent review in thorax uh, showed that in uh, children with MDRTB, 137 of them, uh, almost all of those children, 96.4% uh, received ofloxacin, another 1.5% received moxifloxacin. Now, this uh, study came from South Africa. It's also important, so the South Africans in MDRTB and children are going straight for the fluoroquinolones. And it's important to recognize that the uh, pediatric infectious disease community has come out uh, in 2011 with uh, actual guidelines saying that the experience with quinolones in children has failed to replicate the arthropathy noted in beagle puppies. There is a general consensus that the benefits of quinolones uh, outweigh any risk in, uh, in dr drug-resistant tuberculosis. So I think we, uh, uh, when needed in children, quinolones should be used uh, without uh, too much worry. Uh, another case to uh, get us thinking about special situations, uh, this is a 67-year-old uh, diabetic man in Baltimore. He uh, immigrated from Afghanistan two years ago. Uh, he comes in uh, with cough, fever, and weight loss for three months. Uh, two months ago, he was treated for community-acquired pneumonia with levofloxacin for a 10-day course. Now he's AFB smear positive, and he was started on uh, four drugs and uh, the culture turned positive at three weeks. And here is his chest x-ray. You can see uh, patchy uh, infiltrates on both sides, right greater than left, and what looks like a cavity at the right apex. At six weeks, the lab calls with the following drug susceptibility test. There is resistance to isoniazide, susceptibility to RIF, ethambutol, and streptomycin. The question for you is what to do next. Stay the course with standard therapy. Drop the isoniazide, but continue rifampin, pyrazinamide, ethamitol for six months. Drop the isoniazide, but continue rifampin, pyrazinamide, ethamitol for nine months. Uh, ask the micro lab to perform high and low level INH susceptibilities. Ask the micro lab to perform quinolone susceptibilities. Drop the INH, add moxie, and continue RZE for six months. Drop the INH, add moxie, and continue RZE for a total of nine months. So I can see your votes are coming in, and I'll add again that there is no one right answer. Um, I, I don't know if the system will allow you to vote more than once. I think there are multiple uh, correct answers here. So it looks like... Um, uh, um, many of you are saying, ask the micro lab to perform high and low level INH susceptibilities. About 25% uh, of you say that. Um, ask the micro lab to perform quinolone susceptibilities. About 21% uh, of you are saying that. Um, and I would uh, uh, totally agree uh, that uh, those two items um, uh, make a lot of sense. We need to know. Um, uh, uh, if this is low-level INH resistance, because there is some thought that one can treat through that, um, and we would like to know if we can use quinolones uh, for this individual. Um, uh, I think uh, we certainly need to uh, not stay the course. Uh, and, uh, well, we need to know the INH susceptibilities uh, before we can make a decision on whether to drop the INH, so I think A, B, and C really can't be decided upon until we get the drug susceptibilities. 
But the classic teaching uh, is that uh, in individuals with isoniazide monoresistance, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and thambutol are effective. I would say that answer B is uh, incorrect because this patient has a large cavity, and we know that in individuals with uh, extensive cavitary TB, treatment should be run for a total of nine months. So this gentleman is uh, likely destined for a total of nine months of treatment. But then the question is, should we be using moxifloxacin in uh, INH-resistant uh, tuberculosis? And uh, that's a, um, a burning question. Uh, and I'll say that there are very little data to support using moxifloxacin in INH monoresistant disease, with the possible exception of the Rifiquin study, which I uh, showed you where uh, a six-month course that lacked isoniazide was as effective as control in the third treatment arm. The six-month uh, therapy with moxifloxacin in place of isoniazide and with rifapentine as the rifamycin. Uh, that's not exactly what this patient is receiving. Um, so I have to say that there is weak evidence that uh, moxie should be added in place of, of INH when there's isoniazide monoresistant disease, but it's a, uh, a question that certainly needs more research. I'll also point out that uh, the quinolones uh, come with some hazard. While they're generally uh, well tolerated uh, with um, mild uh, uh, problems of nausea, headache, and insomnia. The tendonitis uh, can really uh, uh, be severe when it happens and uh, lead to significant morbidity. The issue with QT prolongation uh, needs to be taken into account, particularly in an elderly individual who may have some underlying heart disease. And the quinolones have been closely associated with C. diff-associated diarrhea. So I think we need to be cautious about reaching for the quinolones willy-nilly. Um, uh, and I think we certainly need more research on this question of whether to use them in INH monoresistant TB, which, as I mentioned, is now 10% of the tuberculosis in the United States. Um, I'll also uh, point out that uh, current studies uh, show that quinolone resistance, while on the rise, is still in the low single digits. Um, the highest reports I've seen are uh, below 4%, but uh, we don't want that situation to get worse. Um, I uh, will also point out, as we mentioned earlier, that uh, quinolones, uh, when used in patients who could have TB, have been clearly shown not only to lead to quinolone-resistant TB, as we discussed earlier, but to lead to a delay in the diagnosis for pulmonary TB. This has been quantified in some recent studies. Uh, when um, pure quinolones are used for what's thought to be community-acquired pneumonia, there's an average of 19 days in the delay of diagnosing the pulmonary TB. And similarly, um, uh, there is a, a correlation with a mono, mono resistant, uh, with quinolones uh, being, qu uh, with the development of quinolone resistant TB, a 2.7 fold higher risk of quinolone uh, mono resistant TB in patients who receive quinolone for what's thought to be community acquired pneumonia. So um, we're nearing the end, and I thank you for your patience. Um, back to our scorecard. Uh, we started this, uh, this uh, journey out looking for shorter, more intermittent, uh, and INH uh, um, lacking regimens. I would say that the phase three studies have not demonstrated uh, that we can shorten therapy with quinolones to four months. However, uh, the success of the Rifiquin regimen uh, shows that uh, quinolones can be used in situations that can lead to a much greater intermittency uh, uh, as in that Rifiquin regimen. And similarly, we can eliminate the use of isoniazide uh, with regimens like the one in the uh, Rifapen, uh, Rifiquin uh, study. So uh, to wrap things up, it's uh, finally over. Uh, I entitled this study, A Wounded But Not Dead, Is There a Bright Side to These Three Largely Negative uh, uh, Phase Three uh, Clinical Trials? Is the glass half full or half empty? I think uh, uh, we did get one positive result, the Rifiquin study uh, that showed equivalence to uh, standard therapy. And we got some other information that it's worth pointing out that uh, the safety issues of using quinolones for four to six months has largely been put to rest. Uh, there's no evidence of QT prolongation, tendonitis, dysglycemia, or hepatitis. Hepatitis had been a concern because um, uh, it's uh, 
uh, because of the problems with rifampin, pyrazinamide, and latent TB leading to fatal hepatitis, uh, uh, the, the use of uh, MOXI without INH um, uh, led to some concerns uh, over that. Um, and uh, uh, therefore, I would um, um, say that there was also a, a hint of, uh, of benefit in the Chennai study, which uh, used uh, thrice weekly moxifloxacin in place of the thambutol. Uh, and uh, in the subgroup studies from the Oflatub study, there was the possibility that uh, individuals who had a, a low body weight were doing equivalent to standard therapy because of greater gadifloxacin exposure and that uh, perhaps there would be a subgroup of individuals, such as individuals who convert their cultures at two months and have non-cavitary disease. And the optimists out there are already talking about this. Is a four-month regimen adequate to cure patients? And uh, a reassessment of, uh, of the British medical research uh, uh, trials in Singapore uh, in this particular publication suggested that um, a four-month regimen with a relapse rate of 5.9% was uh, almost as statistically uh, valuable as a six-month regimen, leading to some speculation that we might be able to find the right subgroups with a quinolone-containing regimen that would uh, be as good as standard therapy in four months. So glass half empty, empty glass half full, the, uh, the pessimists uh, are uh, uh, called the dark cloud, the lemons rather than lemonade, uh, dark cloud and not the silver lining. Uh, the question for us is, uh, are the quinolones for TB uh, going to be uh, in the uh, half empty or the half full uh, side of the coin? Uh, uh, the optimists, of course, are accused of telling lies, damn lies, and relying on statistics or politics. Um, so stay tuned. I think the quinolones are, are wounded but not dead, and there's much more to be learned. Thank you. Well, that was absolutely fantastic, Bill. That was great. I want to personally thank you so much for a great, great talk. And uh, the way you know a great talk is you got a ton of questions. So I, I know we're uh, running short on time, Bill, so I'm going to jump to it. But I wanted to start, uh, you know, a little daring for you guys, for you to say at the end uh, about politics. Huh? I mean, uh, uh, somebody from John Hopkins actually running for president. Uh, a, a big move there, huh? Yeah, uh, just for the audience, uh, David and I were joking about incriminating pictures, and I tell my residents and fellows, be careful what you do on camera, because you never know when someone from Johns Hopkins is going to run for president again. Uh, so it's, a, it's an exciting election, I will say that. Well, look, we got a, a couple of questions, Bill. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, the, the first question we got is, you know, one of the questions about, you know, uh, when we're looking at the three, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine articles, looking at the phase three studies, you know, the question about relapse and um, treatment failure, if you could quickly just review the difference in, 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 first of all, the definition, and then more specifically, the questions that were coming through about, was it truly relapse or was it reinfection? Was that looked at? And in those that did relapse, did they look at fluoroquinolone, the development of fluoroquinolone um, resistance? Excellent questions. And um, the, um, the microbiology in the three papers uh, had been done preliminarily. Um, the RFLPs had not been done to, um, in, in most of the studies, but was undergoing analysis to uh, rule out reinfection with the second strain. However, in all patients that relapsed, uh, there was an assessment for drug-resistant relapse, and that uh, 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 generally did not occur. I think there was one uh, case of relapse with uh, a mono-resistance to, uh, to rifampin. I, I would have to look it up. But there was um, uh, no issue of relapse um, with uh, drug resistance to quinolones in, in, in these studies. So the, the regimens uh, prevented the uh, acquisition of drug resistance, but uh, they, they did not cure. That, that, I mean, that's fantastic. Thanks. And let me ask you another question. I mean, one of the things that I find is really fascinating is something you kept alluding to was the issue of area under the curve with rifapentine and moxie versus C-max. And, you know, it, it, seems to, it, it seems to maybe hint at 
that when it comes to sterilization, that Cmax may be more important than area under the curve. Which brings us to our next point, which is there's a number of studies in the mouse model that suggest higher doses of rifapentine may be more effective uh, and may be shortening. So do you want to comment on the whole concept, maybe that the next time around, because the next question is, is where do we go from here? And we know that they're, we're already going from here. So is the next steps maybe using the quinolones with higher doses of rifapentine more often? Yeah, I would agree with you, uh, David. You know, the, um, the uh, determining the uh, parameter that uh, is most effective is arduous work, um, even with uh, uh, an easy infection like staph or E. coli. It takes um, uh, literally thousands of mice with different regimens to try to figure out whether the antibiotic is working in a Cmax mechanism or an AUC mechanism. Quinolones are classic AUC killers, but it hasn't been closely addressed in M. tuberculosis. So it might be that we uh, have um, uh, are guilty of extending the work in staph and other bacteria where we believe that AUC is the, is the major parameter and, and falsely try to maximize AUC of rifapentine when, in fact, it, it could be Cmax. So I think we're going to see a lot more pushing the dose of rifapentine. Um, it was exciting that in the rifaquin study, patients tolerated 1,200 milligrams. Uh, there was some concern that they would uh, suffer malaise and flu-like symptoms, uh, but that uh, uh, was not the case. Um, of course, these studies were done in uh, overseas populations. Uh, those individuals are frequently thought to be more stoic than American populations uh, less likely to report their, their complaints. So uh, it'll be exciting that TBTC is looking at these higher uh, rifapentine dose studies. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say nothing, but that last statement about, you know, that us Americans may, may, not, may not be that stoic is going to kill your presidential run. I just want to make that point. But, um, you know, I, I just want to make one more statement on that, and then we'll go on to the next question. But you know, you made a great point that I always want to remind is that TB is not staph is strep. The doubling time is so slow. And I think that you're right. I mean, the, I understand the, the problems with showing it, but I think sometimes we may make a mistake of using bacterial uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics for TB. But just that's just a comment of mine. And my other comment is being from New York, there's plenty of mice that we could use for these studies. So don't worry about the mice. But um. The other question that we had, uh, all the way from Greece, actually, where obviously your comments about the uh, politics probably won't uh, hit as hard, but um, they wanted to know about what was, you know, how was the drugs tolerated as far as like, especially with multi-drug resistance and, uh, but with the fluoroquinolones, um, you know, specifically allergies. Did they see drug allergies, rashes? We, we in our experience, we don't see that much to the fluoroquinolones. And then lastly, um, you know, there is these statements now with the fluoroquinolones that are being reported granted sporadically of this very severe peripheral neuropathy that, that seems almost idiosyncratic, but seems to occur and then last longer. Any comment on both the um, rashes, allergies, any, any comment on that, and also any other side effects um, besides the typical uh, tendon? Yeah, the, 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 uh, the three New England Journal studies um, uh, focused on uh, severe side effects and, um, and death. And uh, the severe side effects were limited to a handful of individuals in each arm across the arms of the studies uh, in all three studies. So they had very few um, uh, serious adverse effects. Um, uh, and I, I agree with your point that um, a, a neuropathy or a rash uh, might not uh, have fallen under the, um, the serious adverse event. They also did passive surveillance, I have to say. They did not go out and do EKGs on these patients looking for QT prolongation, nor did they do uh, spot glucose checks to look for dysglycemia. So it is uh, certainly possible that under a North American scrutiny, uh, we, would, we would get a um, side effect profile that was not as optimistic as the ones that came through with these uh, these uh, African, Asian, and South American patients. A lot. I mean, and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, other question coming up about the rifapentine, and I know this was not necessarily a talk on rifapentine, but I do, I think we both agree 
that the combination of rifapentine and the quinolones looks very, very promising. I think there's going to be a lot more studies. And the question specifically was for us uh, TB, uh, you know, personnel who, uh, you know, would be the ones giving the drugs. You know, the question is always with rifapentine and how it's better absorbed with food. The question, I guess, is, is that, you know, how important is it to give food rifapentine and what if you don't? And uh, I guess, and more specifically, it, it, you know, is that maybe going to be, maybe is that the point about using the higher dose of rifapentine, how that may overcome that, uh, that limitation? My understanding, David, is that those uh, studies are ongoing, the, the precise nature of the food requirement and, and how, how much you can um, overcome it by pushing the dose. Um, uh, of course, you know, if you push the dose and somebody takes it with food and somebody doesn't, then you, you run into the, the, the possibility of getting an ultra high dose in some individuals and not in others and, and a higher possibility of side effects. Um, but I, I do think we're going to uh, need to answer that question. Uh, it was interesting to me that the issue of the food requirement um, uh, was, was po posed as an issue for these relatively poor countries of, uh, of the, ability, the need to, to provide uh, two eggs and some bread for these, uh, these patients. That was actually a significant issue with complying with the, um, the requirements of the study, that the, the sites often had to uh, go to some trouble to make sure there was food on hand for those those individuals. That is much less likely to be an issue with North American patients, uh, but it was an issue in, in uh, these relatively poor countries, as of course is the, the issue of rifapentine and moxifloxacin and cost. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I, I always think it's interesting that they, I agree with you that they picked eggs as they are, they are fatty food and uh, high cholesterol food yeah. uses the absorbent. I guess always bringing uh, you know the egg McMuffin overseas. But um, the other questions that we're getting asked is, with you know, you you alluded to it. You know, with all the molecular um, rapid testing for resistance coming closer and closer to home. Uh, you know, right now I think most of us have access to at least the gene expert, and you know, uh, for some of us the INH and Rafanfa with the Heinz test. But the the new Heinz test plus, not new, but the next generation probably become more rapid. The question is being. Would you suggest getting routine GYRA mutations, or should we, should we be testing for fluoroquinolone resistance, especially in patients who may have uh, had uh, fluoroquinolones in the past? I think um, it, in a patient with, um, uh, with uh, drug, uh, any drug resistance on their antibiogram, uh, we're going to want the lab to report out the quinolone um, uh, resistance based on a growth assay. Um, I, I know that at, at our hospital, molecular assays for um, uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing are not prime time. Uh, they may be cheaper and actually be proven to be better, but we're still going with culture all the way. And, um, and in fact, here, uh, quinolones are, are just part of the first line testing. Whenever there's a, 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 a positive growth on a TB culture, we get a quinolone susceptibility. Um, so uh, I, I do think it's um, important to determine that uh, um, anybody who has a fever in this country uh, uh, for more than a couple of days is highly likely to see an antibiotic, <clears throat> and often that antibiotic is a quinolone, and, and sometimes patients can't tell you what antibiotic they took, and, and that raises the possibility that they're quinolone exposed. So I, I think um, uh, we're going to see a lot of changes coming down the pike. Uh, and I, I firmly believe that in 20, 30 years, um, uh, standard microbiology is, is going to be fading in, in favor of molecular tests. But I think in 2015, we still need the, the culture-based quinolone susceptibility. I agree. I think that uh, the only thing I would say just as kind of a conference, you know, just is that, you know, right now, if you're going to decide, and I know we're not there yet, but if you're going to decide, you know, you're going to use a four-month regimen, the GYRA may be a way to kind of tell you that it may be okay or not, but I think we both agree that um, just because you have a GYR may, or GRA mutation doesn't necessarily mean you're resistant to all the quinolones. And, and like you said, I think you'd agree, and we're still learning, but there may be certain mutations that, make you, that may make you choose one quinolone over the other, but this is not ready for prime time, I think you'd agree. Totally agree. So talking about one quinolone versus the other, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the quote-unquote Bangladesh regimen, the new 
not, you know, nine month regimen for MDR that's really seen some really nice success overseas. And, um, you know, in that regimen, as you alluded to, Bill, is that they use gadifloxacin, but in this country, we don't have access to gadifloxacin. And obviously, there's no studies to show this, but um, what is your feelings about the interchangeability? You kind of alluded to it, and I think the reason I'm pointing out is that it was very important. I thought you made a great point about how Gaddy and Moxie may be, um, it may be similar in their spectrum and effectiveness, but what do you think, what would be your comments on that? I think, if anything, Moxie is slightly better. Um, they're, they're comparable, um, uh, but um, in, in uh, and I didn't show the, the MIC data in large collections of strains, but uh, there is some evidence that Moxie is more potent uh, on a milligram per, per uh, milligram basis. Um, so I uh, would be very comfortable uh, using the Bangladesh regimen with Moxie in place of Gaddy, and I think it would only be a little bit better, if, if anything. I just, just you know, one more question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, just to um, but point out that in that Chennai study uh, that, that came out in 2013, um, the the um, Gaddy was by far the worst uh, 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 four month regimen. Moxie was the one that seemed to be slightly more promising. So you could even see a, a difference in those in those studies head to head in the same patient population of Moxie being slightly better than Gaddy. I, I agree. I, I think it's just, you know, as we may be faced or at least looking at how do we, in certain very, very select uh, patients, uh, maybe utilize that regimen, you know, the question is going to come up. So um, just, you know, one more comment and then I, I want to thank you because we're running over. And, uh, but, you know, so, uh, and this question is really for my colleague, uh, Connie Haley, who uh, both of us uh, share uh, the medical consultation here in the South. I think Connie would agree there is not a week that goes by where we're not getting a call from the community about utilizing fluoroquinolones in somebody who's INH resistant or using fluoroquinolones to make somebody smear negative faster. And I know you've, you've alluded to it, but I think it's, it's an important summation, which is that is there a role in either of those situations? You know, we see it, I think we just love our fluoroquinolones, like you said. Is there really any evidence to support the use of fluoroquinolones for either of those situations? Yeah, the, the short answer is there's no hard data head-to-head um, -head, um, with the existing uh, standard recommendations that um, do not, uh, like with INH monoresistant, uh, uh, there's no uh, evidence that there's a, uh, an advantage of using adding a quinolone as opposed to what's in the recommendations to just treat with rifampin, and thambutol. Um, uh, and similarly with bone tuberculosis, um, quinolones do penetrate bone very well, but we just don't have studies uh, to show that that's better. Uh, and, and I'll come back to the fact that quinolones don't come for free. They do have side effects, and particularly in an elderly compromised individual with potential cardiac disease or C. diff risk, um, it's not a simple decision. Uh, so I. Uh, ideally, when, when we do this in five more years, uh, we'll have some hard data on, uh, on, on quinolones in those two special situations, but we lack it right now. Uh, I, I agree, and actually, I, I lied. I said one more, but we got a great question here. You know, so Ken is asking, based on the PKPD uh, data, uh, what do you think about, you know, could levofloxacin be used in place of moxie, you know, due to its lower cost to most of our TV programs? And the question of possible less QT prolongations. Um, what do you think about Levo for Moxie? And again, I, on the other hand, I, I, the whole issue of uh, the the uh, le, you know the um, the the, uh, the longer half life. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think it's an inferior drug microbiologically. Uh, I think Moxie um, is is more potent uh, from um, a milligram per milligram uh, basis uh, than, than Levo, and so. If I were going to use a quinolone, I'd use Moxie. I think the price of Moxie is going to come as generics uh, start to come onto the market. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, things are going to change, and I think it's one of these times where every, all the moons may align, you know. So uh, as we gain more and more data, you're, you're right. I think that Moxie will become more accessible to most of us. Hey, uh, Bill, I, uh, I, I, I said this to begin with, and you far exceeded it. It was outstanding. Unbelievable presentation. I, I want to thank you so much. And on behalf of all the audience, 
we cannot thank you enough for taking the time and sharing with us today. And I also want to make one other statement that I think your, your talk so well illustrated that we don't give enough credit to. If you look at most of the work or a lot of the work that was done, how much important research is being done throughout the country, throughout the world. In particular, I want to give a lot of cred credit to the CDC's uh, tuberculosis trial consortium, which has done so much work and continues to do so much work. And Bill, I want you to please take this home to all of your colleagues. We so appreciate all the work you guys are doing at the Johns Hopkins T uh, Center for TB Research because we're learning every day. And thanks to that research, we're able to treat our patients better. So I want to thank you so, so much today, Bill, for joining us. We really appreciate it. A great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.